and welcome to my first ever episode of American Murder Stories. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am your host, Lorraine Purden, and in this podcast, I am going all true crime as I discover cases from North, Central and South America. For my first episode, I am going to North America, the Midwest to be exact. The Midwest would become the hunting ground for serial killer nicknamed the Highway Killer, and that would be Larry Eiler. On August 21st, 1984, in Chicago, Illinois, Joe Bala, a building janitor, would make a gruesome discovery. Inside a dumpster, wrapped in black bags, he would discover the body of a dismembered teenage boy. The body in the bags would be identified as 16-year-old Danny Bridges. Danny was a young boy who had experienced a lot of pain in his short life. As a child of sex abuse, he spent the last four years of his life as a child sex worker. Unfortunately, he would cross paths with Larry Eiler, ending up in his apartment where he was fatally stabbed in the back. He also had multiple stab wounds to the chest. Eiler would be found guilty of his murder and sent to Pontiac Correctional Centre in Illinois, where he would sit on death row. Larry Eiler was born Larry William Eiler on the 21st of December 1952 in Crawfordville, Indiana. He was one of four children born to George Howard Eiler and Shirley Phyllis Kennedy. Larry did not have a great start to his life. His father was an alcoholic and would regularly beat his mother. The beatings didn't stop at the mother. His rage was also directed towards the children. Eventually, Shirley would have enough courage and leave her husband when Larry was only two years old. This move away from her abusive husband did not improve things for Shirley or her children. Being the only provider for her kids, she had to work long hours to get money. This meant the children were in care of babysitters, foster care, and would often be left on their own with their elder siblings, who then themselves were still quite really young. Despite the family not always being together, it would appear that Larry did love his mother and she also loved him. The children would spend long periods of time away from the mother, but they would eventually move back in with each other, all being together, which is what they wanted. His mother would marry three more times after her divorce, and this made Larry's life even more difficult. The new men were not a good influence. One of the stepfathers in particular was extremely abusive and so violent towards Larry. As a form of punishment, he would hold his head under hot water. Going to school for Larry gave no relief. Larry attended St. Joseph's School in Lebanon, Indiana. Unfortunately, though, because of his home life, money being tight, parents being divorced, he was bullied quite a lot. His younger sister, though, would be by his side. Teresa was a constant support for her brother and always there for him. But Larry's behaviour would become unpredictable and therefore he became hard to handle as he got older. When he was about 10, his mother decided to take him for a psychological evaluation as she couldn't deal with his behaviour and his outbursts any longer. He was shown to have average intelligence, but the evaluation did show he had issues with severe insecurity and fear of abandonment. It was no surprise that after all the abuse, both physical and mental, and all the people that had come and gone in his life, mainly his father, he would begin to act out. After the evaluation, though, it was suggested that he be removed from the home. As a result of this, Larry was sent to a Catholic boys' home in Fort Wayne in 1963 for about five or six months before his mother would bring him home. Larry was very unhappy here and would keep calling her, pleading to come back, and eventually she did agree. Eiler's behaviour did improve for a while. He was at an age where, at school, it was very normal for boys and girls to start showing interest in the opposite sex. Any interest in the same sex would tend to be shied away from. Eiler did date girls, but this was more done out of expectation than what he actually wanted. He apparently was never physical in any of these relationships. Larry realised that his interest was towards boys. He decided to tell his family, which luckily they were on board with and they accepted him for it. But he himself did try and resist his own sexuality, but he soon realised he didn't have an option. But his religious background made it really hard for him to come to terms with the fact that he was gay. He would leave school with not much in the way of education, but he did manage to get his GED. In 1974, he would meet a library science professor called Robert David Little, and the two would live together. There were conflicting stories as to whether or not these two were actually a couple, but they did like to visit gay bars together, and this is when Eiler got into BDSM. 
Eiler didn't exactly adhere to the rules of BDSM. He just wanted to do what he wanted to do and the other person had no say. He wasn't into consent and BDSM is very much about consent, passwords, but this wasn't for him. So basically, Eiler was a sexual sadist. Despite his behaviour, he was known as a really nice guy by most who knew him, but they did hear about how once he got into the bedroom, he changed and become very violent in his sexual encounters. This then led to uncontrollable urges and in 1978, he would take it to a new level. He could not find anyone who wanted to do what he wanted, so he went looking for a person to act out his twisted fantasies, whether they were a willing participant or not. This would lead to an arrest after an attack on ex-Marine, 19-year-old Craig Long. This would be the catalyst for a life that would see many men brutally killed. In the summer of 1978, Craig was hitchhiking in Indiana when a young Larry Eiler would stop his truck and offer him a ride. When Craig wanted to leave the vehicle, this is when things turned dark. Craig believed it was money he was after, but soon realised Eiler wanted a lot more. Eiler would place an eight-inch butcher knife to his rib cage and then drive him to a secluded area. Craig was then handcuffed with his hands behind his back and it was soon made very clear by Eiler that he was there to sexually assault him. Luckily for Craig, he did manage to set himself free, but unfortunately Eiler was not far behind him. He would demand that Craig get back into the truck and when Craig refused, he stabbed him. Craig did manage to play dead though thinking if his attacker thought he was no longer alive, he would leave him be. Craig said, I just closed my eyes and laid there, thinking probably he'd stab me again if he thought I wasn't dead. This worked. And once Eiler's footsteps were becoming fainter and fainter, he would manage to bring the handcuffs to his front and make it to a nearby trailer park and get help, all while his hands were grabbing his chest as blood seeped through his fingers. Eiler was arrested. He tried to put the attack down to like a an accident, a sex game gone wrong. He was charged with aggravated battery and he did in fact plead guilty to this charge. His bail would be set at $10,000, which his friends helped him raise. And this showed what people actually thought of him. They must have liked him an awful lot to go to so much trouble to make him to help him raise so much money. Craig would not press charges in the end, though, as he was offered $2,500 to drop them. This enabled Eiler to plead not guilty and the charges were dismissed, with Eiler simply having to pay $43 for court costs. After the attempted murder of Craig Long, many more men, at minimum 21, would be killed between the years of 1982 to 1984. In 1983, bodies of teenage boys and young men began to show up with similarities in how they were killed and how they were displayed after death. They had their trousers and underwear around their ankles, shirts pulled open and multiple stab wounds. Bodies were mainly concealed by branches. The issue with this case and what made it hard to capture him sooner is firstly, it was done over various states and the 80s wasn't as advanced in technology for the police to actually talk to each other and most of the men killed were homosexual and unfortunately, they were not classed as a priority back in the 80s. About 10 men would have to die before the police realised that one person was responsible for all of them. But once they did start communicating, more was done to try and catch what they now believed was a serial killer. The attack would be back to haunt Craig Long, though, in 1986, when he would testify against Eiler about the abduction and the attempted murder. Two other men would also come forward and testify about their experience with Eiler, one of them being Ed Healy. In 1980, Healy agreed to have a sexual encounter for money. This led to Ed being beaten and cut with a knife and also being threatened with a shotgun. Like Craig, Ed was also restrained, but for some reason, Eiler decided to let him go. After this, Eiler, who had been living in Indiana up until this point, decided it was time to try somewhere new, so he moved to Chicago, Illinois. In the summer of 1981, Eiler, now 28, was ready for a relationship. Eiler would have a relationship with a 20-year-old man, John Dabrowski. Dabrowski's wife was very much aware of her husband's sexual escapades. Eiler would even stay in the family home. She did allow it. As long as they appeared like husband and wife to the outside world, he was free to do what he wanted in private. They did have an open relationship, but needed to keep up the facade of a happily married couple. 
So while he did spend a lot of time with John, he would also go back and forth to Indiana to see Robert David Little. Despite Eiler choosing to go with a married man, he would get very jealous of John. There was a lot of hypocrisy there. Eiler felt he was free to do as he pleased, but John had to be dedicated solely to him. And at times he would even get jealous of the relationship that John had with his wife. In 1982, though, this is when Eiler could no longer hold it together and the killings started. Now, there is a lot of conflicting information about when these murders happened. And a lot of the information did come on uh, Eiler's deathbed, basically. In October 1982, he picked up 14-year-old Delvoid Baker. After he killed him, he was simply dumped at the end of the road. He had been strangled. Craig Townsend was the next to get into his car. The 21-year-old was drugged but knew something was wrong but would soon pass out. Craig Townsend, though, would actually survive and he simply woke up in a hospital. 19-year-old Stephen Crockett would be next. Stephen would be drugged and stabbed 32 times. In November, he would murder Robert Foley, who was dumped outside Joliet, Illinois. And on Christmas Day, the body of 25-year-old John Johnson was found. He was left in a field in Belshaw, Indiana. In the same month, the bodies of 21-year-old John Roach, 23-year-old Stephen Agin and 22-year-old David M. Block were also found. It was wonder did Eiler have an accomplice for any of the murders and he would name one. He would name Robert David Little as being involved with the murder of Steve Agin. Eiler spoke of how the two men promised the young man that he would be paid to have sex with them. According to Eiler, they took him to an isolated abandoned building. Eiler said they tortured and stabbed the young man and also photographed the whole murder. He said Little basically directed the entire thing. So while Little was arrested, he wasn't actually convicted for the murder of Stephen Agin. Stephen was divorced with a child and he worked for his father's car wash and he would play a key role in the investigation later on. In early 1983, a 16-year-old boy would become the next victim, a John Doe. While all these murders were happening, he did still keep up a relationship with John and Robert, but both of them deny any knowledge of the murders and any involvement. In March, Edgar Undercole for 27 was found in Danville, Illinois, along with Richard A. Wayne Jr. April 15th, 1983, in Metawa, Illinois, a caretaker was clearing rubbish on one of the properties which he worked, and he came across a dead body. Now, there was an attempt to really try and conceal this body with the use of an old door and then covering it with branches and leaves on top of it, but a hand did show and he quickly runs off to call the authorities. The area itself was quite a mess with rubbish and it soon became clear that due to the state of the body and how long it had been out in the elements over winter and the body being very decomposed, identifying what was clearly a young male proved difficult. This find was similar to something previously seen a week earlier. A week previous, on April 8th, a body was found by a construction worker in Lake Forest, Illinois. This time it appeared this was done recently as the body had not yet decomposed. But like the previous victim, the person was stabbed. The victim, though, would soon be identified as 28-year-old Gustavo Herrera. In May, the bodies of Jimmy T. Roberts, 18 and Daniel Scott McNeve, 21, and Richard Bruce, 25, were found. While the police had not quite put it all together, a reporter, George Stutfill, of the Indianapolis Star, began to see a pattern. But due to the fact so many jurisdictions were involved, it was becoming more and more difficult to get the police to speak to each other. Dr. Pless, a forensic psychologist, also contacted the State Police of Indiana because of his findings, but nothing was done, and the murders continued. The police at first were more intent on finding differences rather than similarities between the murders. Meanwhile, the gay community was terrified as they knew that they were in danger. Things, though, finally did start to happen after the body of Daniel McNeve was found. On May 9th, 1983, the body of Daniel was found by a farmer. After the murder of Daniel, it was put to the police that Daniel was murdered by someone who had done this before. Dr. John Pless had performed two autopsies on previous victims, Stephen Agin and John Roach, and they could not deny what he had discovered, and this made the authorities finally take notice. 
In July, an unidentified man would be discovered in Ford County, Illinois, again repeatedly stabbed. He has been referred to as Adam Doe. Four months later, on August 31st, 1983, another body was found and again, very similar position and cause of death. This victim was identified as Ralph Calise. Ralph was well liked by his friends and before the murder, he went to sell six joints at a lake and he was not seen alive again. When his body was found, he did still have the six joints on his person. With the death of Ralph, this made three deaths in Lake County within a mile and a half. Pants pulled down, stab wounds, so, so there was definitely a pattern. There was evidence left behind with this one with a tire and boot print, and they did put plaster over it to take a mould. He was also carrying the ID of a woman in a wallet. It belonged to Jolene Redcloud. They tracked her down and she was the girlfriend of Ralph Cleese. Unfortunately, she would find out in a very shocking way that her boyfriend had been murdered. Detective Daniel Collins spoke to her and as he did, he dropped the photos in front of her and she spotted her partner. Now, this was an accident. It wasn't on purpose. Ralph had had an affair, so of course the husband was a suspect, but it was soon ruled out that he didn't have anything to do with it. While investigating the murders, they went to Chicago to see if they could connect the murders and find out about another case in Kankakee that had all the hallmarks of the murder victims they had. A year ago, the same thing happened to Stephen Crockett. Kankakee then speaks to Indianapolis, who have had the same kind of homicide cases, and it is starting to fall into some sort of place where they can no longer see it any other way than the same person must be doing this. Now everyone is working together with all the similarities with the two states. So while they didn't have many clues, one did come from the murder of Steve Agan. They had a crime scene to work with here, as this happened within an abandoned building. On December 28th, 1982, Steve Agan's body was located in an abandoned farm in Newport, Indiana. He had been gagged, bound, mutilated and then killed. And a key was found at the scene. It had the words, government property, please do not duplicate on it. And it was soon concluded that this didn't belong to Steve, but in fact to the killer. So eventually a task force would be set up through the agencies and a tip line was put into place and someone would call to say that they knew who was committing these murders. In the summer of 1983, a call came in from a Tom Henderson. Now, he knew Eiler, and they, he knew that that was the man they were looking for. He knew of Eiler's behaviour, and he also mentioned about the attempted murder of Craig Long, which, of course, would have similarities to the murders. They soon learned about Eiler travelling through the states of the murders, but most of all, Route 41. Eiler would take this route and this was where he would dispose of his victims on this highway. And this is how he would get the name, the Highway Killer. While they had no evidence to bring him in yet, they could keep an eye on him. In September, Eiler would be arrested for soliciting sex on a routine stop. Now, they could bring him in for questioning. On searching his truck, with the consent of Eiler, they found a lot of evidence against him that pointed towards him being the killer. Knife, boots, tire impressions... Despite all this, though, they could not keep him and he was released. And this would unfortunately mean more deaths. While Eiler and I knew the police were on to him, he still carried on with the murders. Even despite a search of his apartment, they could not arrest him, but he did agree to be interviewed. Pictures of the murders were placed in front of him and he did not want to look at them. He, of course, denied it all. After this, he was released, but again, he would be watched. There was not much happening as they followed his day-to-day -day moves, but they did have in their possession a boot. And on that boot was the blood of Ralph Calise. But Larry again was not arrested. All the evidence against him was not enough. So again, they just had to keep an eye on him. And therefore, more were killed. In October, Derek Hansen, 18, was found to be sexually assaulted and dismembered in yet another state. He was found in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Unfortunately, another John Doe was also found in October in Rensselaer, Indiana. He, though, has been recently identified, I think it was in 2021, as 19-year-old William Joseph Bill Lewis. He went missing from Peru, Indiana, and they estimate that he actually died in November of 1982. There was also four skeletons found in October 1983 in Lake Village in Newton, Indiana. Two were identified. One was 22-year-old Michael Boer and 19-year-old John Bartlett. One was not identified and one was decapitated. 
although John Ingram Brandenburg Jr. would be identified in April 2021, but one still remains unknown to this day. After it came back that the blood found on the boots and the knife and the truck belonged to Ralph Calise, Eiler was arrested for that murder, but again, he was freed on bond and let go because all the evidence that they had got on Eiler was said to not be done by the book. His lawyer said he should have never been arrested at that traffic stop, so all the evidence collected was thrown out by the judge, and the police were simply told to keep an eye on him. Unfortunately, Danny Bridges would get into Eiler's truck, where he was taken to his apartment, tortured, stabbed, and then dismembered after he had been let out once again. After this, the janitor found the rubbish bags at the apartment complex containing the body parts. The janitor, recognising that the bags were not what he was used to seeing, he decided to pull one out, rip it open and have a look. And that is when he made the gruesome discovery. Another janitor saw a man dumping the bags and this is what led them to Eiler. This would lead them right to him. He was in apartment 106 and the police went straight to the room and found Eiler with his lover, John, and both were soon arrested. The apartment was then searched. Now, while on first glance, it looked super clean, on further investigation, blood and skin was located in the bathroom and hallway. It was soon made clear that the man in the body was the young Danny Bridges. Finally, Larry Eiler was caught and he goes on trial in July of 1986 for the murder of Danny Bridges. John Dabrowski and Robert Little would both testify against him. The janitor would also testify who was said to be very disturbed by what he had saw and what he had to say. Larry Eiler would be tried and after only three hours of deliberation, he would be found guilty and sentenced to death. Unfortunately, at this stage, he was only guilty of one murder and that was Danny Bridges. He was convicted of murder and aggravated kidnapping and on October the 3rd, 1986, Judge Joseph Urso said, if there ever was a person for whom the death penalty is appropriate, it's you. You are an evil person. You truly deserve to die for your acts. Despite all the other murders, he was never tried for them due to their lack of evidence. Although in 1990 or in Vermilion, Indiana, they decided to take another look into the murder of Stephen Agin. The key. That key they found played a massive part because it turned out that that key would be a match for an office that was used by Larry Eiler because Eiler, for a brief time, had worked for the government. So therefore, that key that was dropped was his. This then gave him the evidence they needed to proceed with a conviction for the death of Stephen. Of course, Eiler would confess, but there was a catch. He wouldn't get the death penalty for this. He got life in jail for this murder. While Eiler got jail time, there still would be doubt over Little and the murder of Stephen. While he was acquitted, there were some jurors that did say they feel they let a guilty man go free. While Little was acquitted, Larry went on to say, I'm very aware of what's happening. I know what Mr. Egan isn't, and I told him to make his peace with God. And after waiting those few minutes, then Dave said, Oh, kill the motherfucker. I then stabbed Mr. Egan, and Dave took another snapshot. I stabbed Mr. Egan, then I stabbed Mr. Egan a couple more times or three times. I don't know how many times. I just did them very quickly. And then Dave came over and then he took the knife from me and he stabbed Mr. Egan while he masturbated. And after he stabbed Mr. Egan a few times, then Mr. Egan went limp. Despite being given the death penalty, he would in fact die at the age of 41 in prison of AIDS. Isla's attorney was a well-known attorney, Kathleen Ziner, and she would make a statement on March 10th after Isla had died. He did make a confession on his deathbed. He would admit to the murders of 21 men, give the names of many, which gave the families a little bit of closure when it came to the murders of their beloved sons, partners and brothers. This confession would also identify 16-year-old John Doe. He was named Irvine Dwayne Gibson. While many names were given, there is still one that is unknown and hopefully one day that man will be identified. I'd like to say thank you for listening to my first ever episode of American Murder Stories 
And if you want some behind the scenes stuff, you can go to my Instagram page as American Murder Stories. You can go to my Twitter page as American underscore murders and Facebook as American Murder Stories. And I hope you tune in for the next episode, which is on Pedro Lopez. And I will chat to you again very soon. Bye.